Okay, so I'm Jacob Kojewski, everybody knows me here, I assume. Um, so my project and thesis was on developing a low energy wireless solution for soil moisture monitoring. I know, exciting topic. Uh, let's go into a little bit of background as to um, why this was chosen. So our planet Earth, about 1.39 times 10 to the 21 liters of water on it, covering roughly, I believe, 70% of the surface. Which seems like, you know, hey, there's all this water around, and what's, what's the, uh, why, why should we care about uh, water if there's so much of it? Well, it turns out that actually less than 1% of it is liquid uh, fresh water. A lot of it is in the oceans, and the oceans are salty, which is, you can't uh, use that for things like agriculture or drinking without processing it first. Um, there's a lot in glaciers, there's a lot uh, trapped in permafrost. So there's a very tiny amount that's actually available in um, freshwater streams, rivers, and groundwater. And as much as pe some people don't like to believe in climate change, droughts are a thing, and they are uh, a problem, especially in, in areas that, de where, that depend on agriculture and sources of water to support that agriculture. Um, Midwest, California, for example, in the United States, um, as well as all over the world. And another problem that we have is that uh, many sources of, uh, of this less than 1% fresh water uh, are actually polluted or still being polluted. So that less than 1% of the total available water for things like drinking and agriculture are actually even smaller. So in terms of, so, so in the field of agriculture, um, as I stated, there's a problem with the limited amount of fresh water available. And you have to, you're basically limited in um, how you can use that water. Do you use it to water plants? Do you use it for drinking? What do you use it for? In ag agriculture, um, if you irrigate too much or too little, you can harm the crop yield. You can actually um, damage the plants if too little or too much water is provided to them. Um, and another big problem is if you just irrigate willy-nilly and not care about how much you're pouring onto the fields, then you can actually end up having the fertilizers that you put on the field run off into the groundwater, which not only wastes the fertilizers, which you want to be used by the plants, but also many of these fertilizers end up polluting the groundwater itself. So you, it's a self uh, perpetuating problem. Um, there are monitoring solutions available, um, both do-it-yourself and commercial, that provide uh, different methods and different uh, and different methods to, and, and different precisions for monitoring the amount of water in the soil. Um, but a lot of the reliable ones, reliable in terms of measurement accuracy and also in terms of longevity um, are expensive. In addition, because of the expense of these systems, you can't have many sensors peppered all over a field, which would be a nice, um, quality, a nice feature to have because then you can, mod you can see wh which parts of the field are being under-irrigated, which parts are being over-irrigated. So the question becomes, can you actually do smart irrigation? Well, for smart irrigation to be possible, you would need to have a very detailed view of the soil moisture content uh, across the field, not just on average. So I'm going to go over uh, several soil moisture monitoring technologies that are uh, avail available out there. Um, both on the cheap end and on the expensive end. So the first uh, technology is what well, I call it battery style because it functions like a battery. Um, I'll go. I have more detailed diagrams for some of these, but 
in brief, it's basically uh, the, the sensor itself is made of two dissimilar metals, and the water in the soil acts like the electrolyte, like you would have in a liquid, uh, uh, I don't know, but a filled lead acid battery. So the more water there is, the more uh, the the higher the voltage across that battery sensor. You have uh, resistive sensors, which basically um, put a current through two probes in the soil, and the more moisture content you have, the more current flows, and you can that's uh, you can measure that and determine how much water there is uh, present in the soil. Um, one of the more reliable methods is known as a tensiometer, which I wish I'd taken out of the cabinet to show you guys. Um, but it basically measures an interesting property known as uh, the water potential, or the, it's literal. It's uh, basically uh, a measure of how much eff how much uh, effort or pressure a uh, plant has to exert to pull the water out of the soil. And that depends on not just the amount of water in the soil, but the type of soil. And these numbers can vary greatly. And different plants obviously have to, uh, are more sensitive or less sensitive to this. So do you want to explain a little bit how the tensiometer works? Uh, right now I'm just going over a brief okay. overview of the towns. I have a couple more slides okay. with a little more detail. Because some of these, I, um, the, the ones that were uh, financially feasible to test, okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I have uh, information on those. So the fourth type that I lo looked into were uh, capacitive sensors, which you, similar to a resistive sensor, you have two electrodes. But instead of putting a current through the water in the soil, you're basically using the, wa the water content the water in the soil as a dielectric. So you're basically making a capacitor out of uh, metal electrodes and mud. <laughs> um, another method, which starts to get into the more expensive side, is uh, TDR, or time domain reflectometry. So you um, have a probe that works as a waveguide. You send a ROF wave down the waveguide, and it um, based the uh, Based on the water content in the soil, the reflective wave is affected differently. So you will have uh, variations in the um, time it takes for the wave to get reflected back. Um, there's also ground penetrating radar, um, which send a radar wave into the soil and the resulting uh, signal is affected by the water content of the soil. And then, last but not least, and perhaps one of the more, uh, this one I did not know about before, is the neutron probe, uh, which is uh, an interesting method where two boreholes are drilled, or more, but effectively you need two. And you have a uh, neutron detector in one borehole, and you put a radioactive pellet in the other one. And you measure, at, at, as the uh, neutrons travel, they don't really, they, I mean, they travel in all directions, but between the one borehole and the other, they uh, interact with the uh, hydrogen atoms in the water that is contained in the soil and scatter. And based on that scattering, you, you can tell like, precisely how much, how, many, how much water is in the soil. Um, that being said, obviously, using uh, radioactive uh, materials requires trained personnel. It's not a cheap method. Um, it takes time to do. You have to drill the boreholes. You can't just leave this out there. Um, so it's great for certain uh, situations, but not for uh, a scenario like agriculture. So. Now, going over some of the techniques or some of the technologies that I uh, looked into deeper. So, this is an uh, example of the, the battery style sensor, um, which you can buy on Amazon for 
like $10. Uh, so this is the probe right here. And the diagram of it is exactly like this. You have two dissimilar metals with an insulator between them. And uh, when this probe is inserted into the soil, it uh, works like a battery. The more water is in the soil, the greater the voltage. And that's what you have um, on the readout here. Um, problems with this are that readout is, at least on this model, literally on a scale of 1 to 10, which is, what, what that means is very arbitrary. Um, because it is, it works like a battery, or is a battery, um, it will corrode over time. Um, in the manual, it actually states that uh, after the, the, the sensor should be pretty, not be placed for long times, and after and before it's used each time, it has to be wiped down to remove uh, some of the oxides that form on the surface. Um, it's also affected by how tightly the soil is packed. If the probe is loose in the soil, you get a much smaller reading. Um, if you jiggle it around in the soil, it also the reading varies wildly. So it's not a it, it, it's not something that I, I think a farmer would trust their livelihood uh, on. Uh, another type, the, the second type that I looked into were the resistive sensors. Um, and these are actually very popular in the do-it-yourself uh, community. You can buy these actually uh, from SparkFun or make, a, make one yourself using um, to conductive electrodes. Typically, people use uh, galvanized nails, things of that nature. Um, and you're basically just measuring the resistance between these two uh, electrodes. Um, very cheap method. Um, it works a lot more reliably than the, uh, the battery style. However, it still uh, is susceptible to the same corrosion issues. and um, the implementation that I made and ran for a few months in a potted house plant resulted in the nice shiny galvanized nails being completely corroded, rusted, and covered in all sorts of uh, deposits. And the and, and basically uh, after a month, uh, the readings were were an order of magnitude different than. Uh, when I first started. So this is clearly not a long-term solution. It would be good, it, like the battery style sensor, it's good for spot checking. So you place the sensor in the soil, take the reading, and then take it out and clean it. But you can't leave it permanently in the soil. And you can't expect to deploy thousands of these in a field, unless you want to employ a thousand people to put these things in the soil and take them out. Um, and this is the, Tensiometer that Rich was asking about. So it's basically a glass or plastic tube um, sealed, filled with water, and the bottom end of it is a ceramic porous cup. And by at, uh, on it, you have a vacuum gauge um, or a vacuum sensor. And um, as uh, as the soil, the soil basically tries to draw the water out of the tensiometer, and that imparts a vacuum on it, which can be measured with the vacuum gauge. And that would be that can be correlated to, <coughs> or that is exactly the um, sort of vacuum pressure that is uh, exit that the plants have to deal with in their own root system. Um, so it is a. It's, it's not a direct measurement of the soil water content, but it's, uh, it's used extensively for, um, for in studies uh, and use cases where you care or about um, how the water con how, uh, how the water content affects the plant growth itself. Um, 
Unfortunately, um, the main problem with these is, or there's several problems. They are accurate, but they are filled with water, so you can't use them. In, you, you can't leave them in an uh, in an area that where the temperature drops uh, below freezing because water will freeze, expand, and crack the probe. Uh, they do require regular maintenance, refilling the water, um, and um, sucking out the air that uh, bubbles in sometimes. Um, so there is, a, there, uh, while being accurate, reliable, and dependable, that do require uh, maybe not constant maintenance, but regular maintenance, which on the order of a, a few of these sensors is OK, but you can't, um, it, it's not feasible to have hundreds or thousands of these deployed. Um, <clears throat> so based on my initial um, reading, research, and testing, the solution that I decided would probably be the optimal one would be a capacitor-based sensor, where Uh, you basically have the um, use the, the water in the soil as the dielectric. And the dielectric constant of water is 80. The electric constant of air is 1. Um, so any even tiny amount of water in the so present in the soil will have a great effect on the capacitance of the sensor. Um, this is a simple equation just for a parallel plate capacitor, um, which wouldn't exactly be the ideal design here because um, you, basically, you have two large areas very close to one another, so there's no way for the moisture to get uh, in or out. But it's the <coughs> the calculations are still uh, or the effects of different parameters in, in the formulas are still similar. So um, if you the proportion of water to air, uh, or the ratio of water to, the, to air um, present in the soil will have an equal and proportional effect on the actual capacitance. Um, yeah. So some preliminary designs that I looked into uh, involved actually using uh, wires in a twisted pair configuration. Uh, this was actually the first uh, implementation, which was basically the twisted pair wire out of uh, Ethernet cable um, because it's tightly wound. And unlike the parallel plate uh, capacitor, um, because the the, the dielectric basically surrounds the electrodes, and the field lines can go um, out of the um, axis of the of the twisted pair wire and be affected by the the water surrounding it. Um, a couple of other designs were looked into using uh, uh, enamel coated wire, which has a much thinner insulation than the twisted pair out of a Cat5 cable. Um, I also looked into using thinner wires. Um, and the different, uh, uh, the capacitance per centimeter um, was different depending on what uh, sort of wire uh, was used. Um, there are formulas for uh, calcul calculating this, however, for the better estimations, or the, all, all of them are effectively estimations because they require um, <clears throat> calculating out the uh, integrals involved in the field lines going between two surfaces. And when you don't, so for the parallel plate design, it's easy. The field lines are all straight. And even the parallel plate equation assumes that this is an infinite plane because the field lines at the edges of a parallel plate start arcing out. And that affects, while, while being a uh, minor proportion of the total capacitance, they do have uh, uh, an effect that's not very easily calculated. So 
because these were just pre preliminary designs and I didn't specifically uh, care about precise amounts, I just wanted to un have an understanding of how uh, different variables such as the distance between the wires, the diameter of the wires, the spacing between the wires uh, affects the readings. Um, and also just the geometry of the sensor. Um, so, you have like a, a pretty significant factors in capacitance there. Is yes. That, is that enough to make an important difference in the final design? I mean, I don't know. Um, you can see that there's a factor of. Well, uh, yeah, this is the capacitance between just being in dry and air yeah. and being submerged in water. Right. So the greater the fact, the the greater the factor between the two, uh, the more resolu the, the more resolution you might have. Well, you have, and the resolution uh, is dependent on this method in, in which you perform the capacitance measurement. Yeah. But when there is a much larger difference, it's a lot easier because you don't have right. to deal right. with noise form. Right. So much if you look there, I mean, the one, the third one up from the bottom, the EC twisted pair coil looks like I, I, the, the biggest difference. I mean, it's substantially greater than yes. all the other ones. So. Uh, I didn't get to that design yet. Um, so uh, these two designs are basically the twisted pair wire, but also coiled in a spiral. Good, and they did the effect wasn't uh, between the wires being straight and coiled up. There was no appreciable difference. Uh, assuming the same wire gauge, same insulator, same distance between them. Um, but it just made the sensor more compact. So why not completely coil the wire and form it into a, into a cylinder? And this is a cylindrical bifiler coil, which means two electrodes that are basically spiraling um, next to each other. Um, and that is how you, how, uh, how you end up with the, these being much larger because Unlike the standard twisted pair, where each conductor is right next to, at any point in time, exactly one other conductor. In a bifiler coil, each conductor is, has the opposite conductor on either side of it. So you end up with roughly, or could end up with potentially almost double the uh, capacitance, because the field lines now aren't just going uh, between Field lines that would be uh, start further away uh, from. Uh, so okay, if you, I wish I drew this. You didn't have a diagram. It's okay. Um, if, if you okay, if you have, if, if you look at the cross section of a twisted pair cable, you have two conductors next to each other, and if you assume, so the field lines are strongest and have the greatest capacitive effect directly on the shortest path between the two conductors. The field lines that have to take the longest path have the least effect. Now, if you place another conductor on the other side, then you end up with field lines that are also have a very short path to the other conductor. There, that, that's how you get the much larger uh, capacitance for that side. Um, and also, I uh, <coughs> made another uh, Sample similar bifiler design to this, but in a flat spiral instead of a coil. Um, which uh, mostly because the coil design requires, uh, if if you placed, if you did, if you were to conceptually think of designing a sensor around a cylinder, um, how do you account for the co the core? Uh, if you leave it hollow then potentially water can collect in there and semi-permanently shift the, uh, the baseline of the sensor. Um, if you put some sort of media inside or even just dirt, let it be in, in, the, in the core of it. If this is a very long cylinder, then um, the time constant for the water to get out of the middle will be much longer, so, which affects the time constant for the whole sensor. So it's not, it wasn't, for those reasons, it was not uh, ideal. Um, in a flat by filer coil design, you end up, you don't have those problems because every uh, 
all sides of the sensor are facing outward. There's no hollow core to collect water or uh, affect the time constant, etc. Unfortunately, so these uh, should have similar um, uh, capacitance readings because they were the same uh, lengths of wire used. Unfortunately, to keep the flat coil in one in the, in the proper shape, it had to be uh, glued together with epoxy, and that extra, however my minute layer of epoxy means that the uh, water with a dielectric constant of 80 can't be as close and affect the field lines as significantly. Um, dielectric constant for most uh, uh, epoxies is around, I think, three or five. It's, it's fairly low. There, there's, not men, the, there's not many materials that have extremely high dielectric constants. Um, most are in the sub. 20 sub 10 um, range. So you end up with uh, a fixed low dielectric constant right next to the set, right next to the electrodes, where it would have the grip, where a higher dielectric constant would have the grip of this effect, and the weaker field, or the longer length and weaker field lines, uh, or electric field lines, are uh, uh, the only ones being affected by the water. So despite this, uh, I went ahead and thought about, well, how could, uh, so, since their flat coil has benefits just by virtue of not having the same problems as the cylindrical coil, how could it be uh, manufactured in such a way that doesn't involve uh, human error on my part, epoxying the thing with a thin layer, or, uh, and also just making it cheap? It, it, for the bifilar coils, that requires a custom mechanical tooling, um, and it's hard to make them consistent. Um, so I figured, why not use a circuit board? Same idea. You have electrodes uh, interdigitated with electrodes on the opposite, with the other electrodes. So you basically have two combs. And uh, both sides of the sensor had the uh, same pattern on them to maximize the amount of um, area that, that can uh, be affected by the um, <coughs> uh, maximize the area that's sensitive to the water uh, or any water present outside of the circuit board. Um, like I said before, a lot of the um, so a lot of the capacitor uh, estimations are complex because they depend on the geometry, and this is a rough I, This is a very rough uh, way of calc of estimating the actual capacitance of this uh, design, which, unlike the uh, the parallel plate capacitor, which is just the the dielectric constant times the surface area of the uh, electrodes over the distance between them. When you start having to deal with field lines that arc out of the sensor and with varying uh, distances for, or varying uh, path lengths for each one, you end up with very complex, with, with fairly complex equations. And this is, it, you would have to do extensive mathematical modeling to actually get a precise answer. Um, so th this is only a rough estimation, but it came out to be actually uh, um, a, a fairly sensitive design. And there's an actual photo of the size of the sensor. It was about uh, three quarter by uh, one by half a centimeter in size. Uh, so you have a penny for reference. Uh, Unfortunately, as great as this design was, there were several issues with it. Uh, because it's a capacitive probe, you can't actually have the electrodes being in contact with the water. Uh, deionized water would be fine, but 
water from that you find in the soil has salts and all, all sorts of um, other um, elements in it, uh, which will uh, which work great for things like the the battery style or resistive sensors where you actually want current flowing through it, but in the capacitor world you do not want current to flow from one electrode to the other. So you want the electrodes to be insulated. Circuit boards, just straight from the manufacturer, can come with a conformal coating. Um, unfortunately, that coating, while to the naked eye looks very smooth and solid, it actually has very tiny microscopic uh, pits in it, uh, which expose, uh, the, or sometimes expose parts of the uh, circuit board traces, or in this case, the electrodes. Um, for most circuit boards that you find in electronics, that's not a problem. In cases where it is, those circuit boards are potted in uh, conformal coatings, polyurethane, epoxy, depending on the application. But uh, as uh, I discovered with the uh, flat bifilar coil, you can't have too thick of a coating because you have any extra uh, layer on top of the electrodes has a massive effect on the sensitivity of the, uh, the probe itself. Another problem with just the bare circuit board design is you can't just stick it in the soil because the soil is basically made of very tiny, sharp things. And you end up with issues like the actual coating being scratched off. And this was after uh, uh, being uh, sprayed with a very thin layer of polyurethane. And when the coating is scratched, you end up with corrosion, you end up with uh, current being conducted from one electrode to the other, which completely, uh, uh, or which, which affects the, the, the readings, the, the, the measurements in a very negative manner. Um, so to solve this issue, uh, basically I, I decided that if we can package the sensor in a rugged uh, enclosure, if you can call a you know, less than one inch square piece of plastic an enclosure, um, then, the sense, then the actual sensing element can be protected from uh, the, the soil itself. Um, however, you need to be able to get the moisture from the uh, surrounding soil to the sensing element. So uh, each side uh, has just standard 50 micron filter paper that you would find in a household water filtration system. Um, that was chosen mostly just due to availability. And uh, the space between the paper and the actual sensing element uh, has, has to be filled with something <coughs> that is uh, hydrophilic, meaning it tends to attract water, it tends to hold it, uh, so that it draws the water from uh, the surrounding soil. So I chose to use diatomaceous earth, which is a very fine particulate powder. Um, it is somewhat abrasive, but not to, I didn't see it to be as abrasive as regular soil itself. Um, so it should be safe, so it seemed to, uh, even after months, many months of testing, um, it didn't seem to act to damage the sensing element itself. And um, it has the property of being hydrophilic, so it tends to pull the water through the uh, filter paper towards the, uh, the sensor. Um, also, because it is a fine particulate powder, it forms a very uh, uniform layer across the sensor, so you end up with whatever moisture ends up in that diatomaceous earth is spread out evenly across the entire sensing element. So you don't end up with air pockets and variations in different part, in different locations of the sensor. Any questions so far? <clears throat> now, I have a sensor. It seemed to work at least in principle. Now the 
question was, you need to get the, you need to perform the measurement and uh, report the data somehow. You can't strew miles of wire across a farm field for obvious reasons. So you need a wireless uh, sensing solution, a wireless backhaul solution. Um, unfortunately, things like well, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth use way too much power, and you can't rely. You you can't uh, expect to operate them on a small battery for extended period of time. I'm talking months or even years. Uh, because you could actually end up in a climate like California, where you have vineyards that are effectively year-round. Um, and even uh, Bluetooth low energy devices don't uh, last on that time scale. Um, so, uh, what I ended up using was a TPK developed here at WinLab. <laughs> That's Ben's little um, baby. Uh, the reasons for using it, not just because well, it was readily available, but it is a low power wireless platform and it's based on the concept of transmit only. So it doesn't actually, it, there is no bi directional communication like you would have with Bluetooth, Zigbee, or Wi Fi. There's no negotiation, there's no, hey, I'm ready to send data, are you ready to receive data? Uh, because it's, it's, wireless radios use about the same amount of energy when they're just listening as they do when they are transmitting. And typically you end up listening for longer periods because you don't know when something is going to transmit. So a base station plugged into the wall can listen all the time. Something powered, or but a device powered by a tiny coin cell battery uh, cannot be uh, listening or expected to uh, listen for extended periods of time because you'll just drain the battery and you will not have uh, the months of uh, required uh, lifespan for this uh, this application. Um, and the TPK has the added uh, uh, benefit uh, because it's so low power, it can run for years on a coin cell. Um, you may not necessarily have it deployed in an agriculture application for years, but the fact that once it's deployed, even if you have to install a new battery at the beginning of uh, just prior to installation in a, in, on a farm, you don't need to worry about it until you you, uh, uh, you, you basically don't have to worry about the sensor for uh, the lifespan of it. There's no maintenance, nothing. Um, so there were there were different uh, ways of interfacing that package sensor probe to the TPK. Um, and each one, and there's various software methods of doing the measurement, each one requiring different uh, interfaces or external components between them. So in the simplest case, you would just have the probe directly attached to a pin on the microcontroller. And depending on the software uh, configuration, you would read the value that way. Or um, you could use two pins. Uh, one as an input and one to basically charge and discharge uh, the, the capacitor probe. Uh, that was slide. Uh, so basically the, the MSP430 microcontroller on the TPIP-K has a capacitive touch feature which only requires a single pin. Um, no external components required. Uh, that being said, it doesn't, uh, it, because it's designed for capacitive touch applications, like did somebody touch a button? Or uh, it's not uh, designed to be very precise. Uh, so it depends that you, while well, you can get a reading on whether there is something or there isn't something, there is something uh, affecting the capacitance of the sensor or not, 
you, it's hard to get a repeatable and reliable or even a precise reading uh, of uh, the capacitance that's actually um, attached to the pin. Uh, that's depend because the, it's dependent on uh, the resistances inside inside the microcontroller on each pin, the pull up pull down resistors, uh, and the, the because this is a digital microcontroller, those are not. There's a wide range of, uh, uh, of values that they can be. Um, so it's hard to, without extensive calibration, it's hard to, um, it, it would be hard to map a particular capacitive load to a particular measurement value. And even then, uh, things like the internal re resistance to the pull downs on the GPIO pins do change with uh, temperature, um, which doesn't affect uh, digital applications as much, but for an analog system, it can have a massive effect. Um, for the two pin, uh, or using uh, two pins and basically charging and discharging uh, the probe, you have slightly higher uh, control over what is actually going on with the, with the probe in terms of uh, its, uh, or what's going on with the probe. Uh, first method is using uh, input pin threshold, so uh, that's a type it should just be. Um, if you set the, if you set the, if you assume this is the, uh, the sensing pin, and you start the probe being discharged to ground, and then you start charging it up through some capacitor, or through some resistor, sorry, uh, at some rate. Because the input pin is digital, at some point it'll, at some point it'll uh, cross the threshold of when the pin will trigger, that is, you know, enter the high state. Uh, unfortunately, like with the, with the capacitive touch function, you have that, Threshold is uh, different for each pin, different for each device, and it varies with temperature. Hard to do. Uh, the more reliable methods use uh, the, and can can use the ADC in the microcontroller, or uh, as I ended up using the comparator, which ends up with instead of just using an arbitrary threshold for a digital value, you act, it, the comparator will actually um, trigger when the value on one input exceeds the value on the other. Um, and two methods were evaluated. One was to just straight uh, measure the time to charge the uh, probe, okay. and the other was to charge and discharge it. Uh, however, they added complexity in the charge and discharge wasn't that there were no perceptible benefits in adding or trying to do the measurement in both directions. Uh, so the method I set on was just How doing How many slides do you have left? Yeah, we, we should speed up a little bit. Maybe we start it like a lot. Okay, so RC charge. Uh, <laughs> effectively, because the, the um, so the time it takes to charge the probe is determined by the resistor that's in the that two pin circuit, um, the supply voltage, and uh, I the, think this is clear. Yeah. Uh, but one thing though is the comparator. I used one half VCC for the uh, for the one input was the voltage across the probe. The other one was one half VCC. Therefore, it didn't matter what VCC was, uh, it would always charge to one half of that. And therefore, the equation became a lot simpler because then I just have a natural log of 0.5. Uh, this is the actual algorithm used. Uh, the biggest benefit, which is would be hard to implement on other architectures that was possible on this, is that the entire mechanism for uh, performing the measurement was done in hardware. 
by in basically using the internal interconnects between the modules. So uh, I'll skip the entire uh, setup on the software side. But basically, uh, it's, it's a, you have a timer module, which uh, records the, time, the number of clock cycles between uh, two trigger points. Uh, it could also trigger the GPIO pin to start, or to flip the state from low to high, the one that was used to charge. Um, so immediately, you know exactly when you start charging the pin because it's all done in, this, in not even the same step, because it's not, it, it's, it's not dependent on the clock cycles. It's not software. It's not executed code. Um, so the pin is, begins to charge immediately when the timer starts to go, coming from zero. And the comparator output was used as the trigger to stop the, uh, the timer module. So there was no loop or anything to check the value. It was done basically in analog. Uh, which right, means so, that, hmm? right? So, I mean, just to try to speed up, the summary of your approach is you, the hardware has a counter that counts up until the threshold is reached, and then that yes. gives you how long. But instead of having discrete, discrete commands, right. you know, start the counter, right. start right. the chart, right. it's all right. done right. by the counter itself. Right. Right. And so the stopping is all done in hardware as in well. Hardware. Right. And so what you're really measuring is the time. You don't have to account for the offsets introduced by. Right. Different uh, clocks, or the number of clock cycles to take to execute right. particular strat commands. Your strategy, right, your engineering design is to rely on this time to charge a capacitor, which is going to change with the soil moisture. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically like, no, no, like it's having a physical stop almost. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. so, so now you have to get into the calibration. So for the measurements, uh, Obviously, with multiple measurements, the noise figure goes down. Uh, the optimal amount was four because after four, after uh, if you take more than four measurements, the gains you get for in reducing the noise for, for each additional measurement isn't as great as when you go from one to two or two to four. Um, and then they were all powers of two because the comparator uh, by design has an offset in it. It's minute, but it's uh, measurable. And it has a function to basically enter within the hardware, swap the inputs, so you can take a reading and then take another reading, uh, and you end up canceling out the the offset. If you ended up doing odd numbers of measurements, you wouldn't can you you wouldn't cancel out that offset. Hence the powers of two. Um, for the timing clock source, I had a choice of using the internal DCO of the MSP430 or the chipset on the or the or the radio chipset's crystal. Uh, the crystal for the radio is much more temperature stable and also provides much higher uh, frequency if desired uh, for the clock. Uh, and that that would be basically the clock input that's used by the timer to count. Uh, So here's some, uh, and it's also the the clock the radio's uh, clock source was more uh, stable, not just across temperature, but also across uh, different battery voltages, brand new battery or uh, one that's at end of life. Uh, and applying these, or uh, yeah, so that was the that's the reasoning for using the radio crystal instead of the internal DCO as the clock source. Um, additionally, to compensate for temperature and, uh, or uh, not temperature, but battery, uh, mix, temperature didn't have that much effect on measurements. Uh, battery voltage did. So using bilinear interpolation, uh, it was possible to cancel that out almost entirely. Um, and this is just the breakdown of the, the equations because this is done on the 16-bit microcontroller. You can't have massive operations uh, and massive equations do it so each uh, the, the entire bilinear interpolation was broken down into many 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 smaller steps uh, and here's the uh, the effect of doing compensation for the, the varying battery voltage with no compensation the readings could vary 
by between, let's say, 2%, uh, plus minus 2% on average. Uh, doing a global uh, calibration, basically averaging out the offsets and everything across different tags and probe combinations, uh, didn't really do much for the offset. It just uh, or didn't do much for the variation, but it did kind of uh, center it more towards zero instead of being offset by about half a percent consistently. Um, and doing individual calibrations on a per tag, per probe combination basis, uh, really significantly reduced it to less than a half percent variation. Um, so energy use was uh, also quantified. Uh, for uh, yeah, energy use is quantified uh, for different uh, clock frequencies from the radio chip. Um, the higher clock frequency you use, the more current <coughs> you use, um, and it's a fairly linear relationship. Um, by this, so you have to so, so basically in order to maximize the length, uh, the lifespan of the of uh, the platform in terms of battery life, you have to choose uh, proper charging resistor value and the proper frequency. So here's a couple of graphs. So part, part of the data in these graphs is simulated. Uh, part of it is actually measured. Um, so you have basically each band is the number of microjoules used to take a measurement uh, based on different clock frequency or resistance values. So it's not ideal to just say, oh, I want maximum possible resolution, because you end up using a lot of, uh, you, you can easily end up using uh, six and a half microjoules per measurement uh, when the capacitance is high. And it's basically at the lowest possible capacitance of the probe and the highest capacitance that could be measured. Those are the two important uh, factors. So the ideal R and F values should be selected based on how much, uh, to minimize the energy, but it's still at the same time uh, give you the sort of resolution that you want. So different uh, frequency values and, and resistance values will give you different resolutions. Um, so basically between, the, the optimal parameters exist between, or must be chosen between, uh, has a compromise between uh, measurement resolution and energy use. Um, as a sidebar, the effects of salinity uh, and salt in the soil were uh, checked. Uh, yes, salt affects the sensor. Uh, no, it doesn't really matter because the amount of salt, so, so, there's always going to be some sort of, some amount of salt, salts present in the water and the soil, um, but it's never a high enough amount to really push it uh, to more than a 1% effect. Um, 35 parts per thousand is seawater. <laughs> So most uh, fresh water is between a half and three. Uh, or mo the recommended levels for irrigation are between uh, half and three parts per thousand, depending on the crop you're um, planting. And most fresh water sources are less than that. Uh, so this is the test setup that was used. Basically, a chamber holding, s an airtight chamber holding soil within another airtight chamber with uh, filter paper between to let water drip out, basically simulating a large amount of soil, so I didn't, uh, so any water poured in, if it exceeded the field capacity or the maximum amount of water that the soil can hold, it would just drip down and uh, the soil would just be at saturation instead of oversaturated. Uh, and this was the test that I've used for measurement. Um, just for, as a sanity check, I used both bare sensor boards and the packaged ones to quantify things like uh, time constants, etc. So two types of soil were used, topsoil and potting soil. Uh, each one had different uh, side, uh, each one had a slightly different consistency and contents. One had more uh, rocks, one had more uh, organic matter, like twigs and things. Uh, and soils were dried out prior to each uh, uh, experiment, and the same amount of soil was used each time with uh, Basically, just create steps of 15 milliliters of distilled water added um, to see what the uh, 
effects for, or what the measurements would be at different uh, volumetric water contents. So excess water was less than two millimeters, but two milliliters, not milliliters. Uh, so the water that would drip out from the soil chamber into the outer chamber, uh, which is good, meaning the 50 milliliter discrete stems weren't too, uh, too off. Uh, these were the measured uh, amounts of water at, that uh, each soil was able to hold at saturation, um, and the volumetric water content was basically the ratio of water to volume of soil. So the actual raw measurements were these. Um, each shape or color uh, represents a different uh, sensor. And as you can see, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, this is just the raw measurement value. But it, w without any calibration, you can't, if you just have a reading of, let's say, Eight fifty. You don't know if that means twenty percent or thirty percent uh, volumetric water content or fifty-five percent. That is a massive. Wait, how did you even get this initial thing without calibrating in the first place? Because you must. No, these are the raw measurement values versus right. the known volumetric water content. I knew what the volumetric water content was because I knew oh, the volume oh, of the soil okay. and the amount of water I oh, added. I see. Okay. All right. So, so you need to make. Yeah. This is known. This is the I measured. See. Okay. You should convert that axis then. Because the real the real VWC is the uh, independent variable weight. This, right, the x axis is the thing that you're controlling, and the y axis is the thing that you're observing. Correct. Right, that was okay. um, so to solve this massive disparity of forty to fifty percent error, effectively, uh, applying the bilinear interpolation, uh, so we have the d different the low battery voltage, new battery voltage. Uh, you still need to have points for what is, uh, uh, at what uh, VWC, what's the lowest one we care about and the highest one we care about. Uh, highest one we care about is the field capacity because any more water than the field capacity and you're flooding the field. Uh, so we don't care about errors higher than that uh, because you want to stay below field capacity. And it turns out that there is a lower point that you do care about called permanent wilting point. If the, if the water content falls below that, uh, you end up damaging the plant. Uh, hence, permanent wilting point. And for most soils, it actually turns out to be roughly half of field capacity. So if field capacity is 60% uh, volumetric water content, the permanent wilting point would be around 30%. So if we calibrate between the permanent wilting point and the field capacity, we end up with uh, a very precise, uh, we can uh, calibrate out the error uh, within, between those two points. Um, and applying the bilinear interpolation to the previous data, we end up with plus minus 3%. Okay. Which is better than 40 to 50. So, in summary, the point was to develop a low-cost solution that can be um, deployed by thousands. Yeah, uh, T of K is inexpensive to manufacture. Uh, the sensing element, because it's a printed circuit board, that is extremely cheap. Practically can um, be considered free. Uh, it's not even on the same order of magnitude as T of K. Uh, it's low power because of the T of K and just the way the capacitor sensing works. Uh, and optimizing the resistance frequency and number of samples, you can maximize lifespan to months or even years of usage. Uh, and using the, uh, those hardware interconnects to get uh, very precise measurements and applying that bilinear interpolation to the measurements you can have a very precise and repeatable uh, system. Some future work that can be uh, done to improve this is uh, the time constant was actually horrific 
for the package sensor on the order of many, many hours. Uh, that could be reduced by using either more permeable filter paper and also reducing the amount of diatomaceous earth. Because basically, uh, the, it would, the diatomaceous earth would, draw, would take a long time to get rid of its, uh, or absorb or get rid of the water uh, from the surrounding soil. Um, more consistent PCB manufacturing would reduce, of the sensing element would uh, reduce uh, some of the errors that I introduced by literally spray coating the, or adding a, 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 a conformal coating just by uh, spray paint can. Uh, so that can reduce the variation between the different sen or different units of sensing elements. Um, and using nonlinear uh, calibrations and possibly even moving the calibration from being built into the the, uh, the TBIPK to wh wherever this data ends up, uh, you can use uh, much more complicated algorithms. You can start using all sorts of different mathematical models and have more capability in improving um, the measurements to probably below 3%. Um, and that's it.